to be the greatest attention. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. So that's the way to think about this, uh, a problem like this where you're going to use this stuff. What about, um, oh yeah, before we, so, ah, we don't have the demo I was going to show. So in, in, a, in, a couple, in a couple lectures, we're going to start looking at oscillatory motion. So let me just mention this really quick. This goes on your, you got it back your mind when it comes up. We're going to have masses on springs bobbing up and down, undergoing harmonic, uh, they're harmonic oscillators, undergoing harmonic motion or oscillatory motion, sinusoidal motion, right? That's the same thing. The mathematics describing that is just the same as what you see when I'm doing uniform circuit motion with this ball and you're looking at it edge on. So when you watch the ball, is it moving from your perspective? Does it appear to be moving faster when it's right in front of me or when it's on one side or the other of me? No. Well, you're not answering the way I would expect. I would expect you to say it's faster in the front of me. Because in the front of me, that's, that's when the velocity vector is perpendicular to your line of sight. So it's really zipping from your perspective along here. If I were to animate this, draw a picture, make a movie of it, right? When it gets toward the edges, it tends to slow down. So if I were to simulate this, it looks like, you know, you look at edge on, it goes fast in the middle, slows down, goes fast in the middle, slows down, fast in the middle, slows down. That's really what it looks like. But it didn't look like that. Oh, you saw it, okay, I should, should confuse you. But that's true. If you made a movie of it and you, you know, analyze the movie, that's what you find. It goes fast in the middle and then slow on the edges. And that's what a weight does when it's bobbing on a spring. It goes quick while it's passing through the equilibrium position and it slows down at the edges. So in fact, circular motion, if you describe it mathematically, you can say, oh yeah, the, let's say we've got x this way and y this way. And these are now, this is vertical, this is looking down from above, and you're seeing motion. If you describe the motion, you'd say, oh yeah, y as a function of time is just going to be some amplitude. Well, it's the length of the, you know, it's the, it's the radius of the vector times sine theta, or sorry, sine, sine time, right? Uh, and y, uh, excuse me, x of t then is going to be something like r cosine of t, right? And there might be, so I could put some, there could be some other factors inside here. In fact, I shouldn't have quantities with units. I can divide by some tau. Something with units. And there's a two pi floating around a bunch of other stuff. But the point is that sine waves and cosines describe the mo circular motion when you break it into components. And we're going to see that more later in this semester. Right? Right now. And that's for uniform circular motion. That's constant speed. Now, if I were doing this and I sped up and slowed, sped the ball up for a while and slowed it down and stuff like that, then this wouldn't be right. You'd have to modify this, right? So this is all uniform circular motion we talked about so far. But that's not the only kind of circular motion we'll encounter, right? Um, oh, yeah. Should I bring it? Yeah, yeah. Let's do the non-uniform first and I'll bring this up next. So many things. There's a lot of stuff. I put all the circular motion into, into one day. I'm pretty fun to get into it. Okay, so you've seen this before. My little roller coaster. See if I can keep it on the, on the rails today. Go around like that. Ooh, yeah, oh, what a relief. So when you're on a roller coaster, you know, I started the thing at rest. I didn't push it. It had zero velocity when it started. But it sped up down the ramp. You're, you're shocked to hear. When it's going through the, the circle, right? Is it speeding up and slowing down as it goes through this vertical circle? It's speeding up over here. What about over here? Is it slowing down right here? Yeah, you bet. In fact, if I started too low, you know, below the top, it wouldn't even make it, right? So it slows down and you know, if you get your money's worth and you actually set it up, right, you're gonna start higher and you actually make it over the top, right? Um, and when that's happening, so what's keeping the ball on the track? Right? When this ball is moving along, right? Like, like in this case, I, I was swinging a ball around on a string, and it's a tension force that was providing a component, a force that was pointing towards the middle of the circle. That's why it was accelerating in the circle, right? In this case, what force is keeping the ball on the track? It's a normal force, right? It's just that the normal force isn't always pointing straight up. It's a normal force like on this chop. It's a normal force that points right up. It's a thing on a flat, a horizontal, I should say, surface. But if you're on a ramp, then the normal force can point at an angle, right? If you're on a changing angle, like, you know, a circle is just a ramp where the angle of the ramp changes, right? So the normal force depends on where you are. I mean, make a free body diagram or solve some problem and solve Newton's second law, and figure out whatever you're trying to solve for. You just keep that in mind that the normal force is determined by whatever the angle is right there. And there's a relationship between the velocity and the acceleration. And acceleration, yeah, so uh, I'll get to that in a second. And the, uh, and the normal force. These things are all related and you have to keep that straight. So what about the acceleration? For uniform circular motion, so if I had a Ferris wheel, so a Ferris wheel goes around a constant angular velocity. The term we haven't used so far in class, but it's moving, it's moving so that the linear velocity of the little cart is always the same. But it's going in a circle, it's a vertical circle. In that case, does the acceleration always point toward the center of the circle? Well, is that uniform circular motion if the speed is constant? Yeah. So does the acceleration always point toward the center? You bet. If it's speeding up and slowing down like a roller coaster, so a roller coaster, gravity sometimes has a component of its force, most of the time it does, that's partially along the track direction. So the cart speeds up when it goes downhill, it slows down when it goes uphill, right? So now is the acceleration pointing directly at the center? No. It's got a component that points toward the center, but it also has a component that points along the direction of motion. All right? So for non uniform circular motion, it still turns out that this is a useful, in fact, a necessary formula for us to solve problems for non-uniform circular motion. But it's not enough. So in this case, it was enough, right? We could use that expression just to represent the full length of the acceleration vector, which was given the axis choice I made here, it's pointing in the x direction, right? No problem. So we just stuck that in for, you know, stuck this value in for acceleration, and then we just interrupted the races and we solved it. In this problem, so suppose we're asked, suppose we're asked for a roller coaster. All right, my roller coaster. Oop. Oh, it's not a very good circle. Ugh. Here, why don't I do this? I'm going to blow my circle up a little bit and just show the part that we are interested in. Do this. So here's my circle, right? Here's the center of my circle. So here's my radius r, right? Got my radius r, and here's the bottom of the circle. And here's some point along the, here, you know, the, the cart's right here at this moment in time, right? Its velocity points tangent. So that's my velocity vector right here. See that? At this moment in time, it's a snapshot, right? So that's the direction. He's coming downhill. He's going like that. And he's got some acceleration. In fact, he's speeding up, and he's moving in a circle. So there's a non-zero component of his acceleration. I'll use a different color because it gets a little busy. So he's got a component of his acceleration that goes this way. And I'm going to call this the, sorry, t for tangent. This is the tangent component, tangential component of the acceleration. And I'm sort of giving away the answers here without pulling on every single step. I know you're disappointed. But the, I know the acceleration points that way because I know the problem is only going to have two forces. It's going to have gravity and the normal force. So I know the resulting acceleration is going to be downward, right? It's not going to be up that way, right? So it's going to have, it's going to have a, a component that's pointing, it's going to have a tangential component that's pointing more down than up, right? Because of gravity. But it's also going to have a component that points toward the center of the circle because that normal force is, main, is doing whatever it has to do to keep that cart on the circle. So there's a component that goes like that. And I'll call that A sub C. C for center or centripetal. So there's two very similar words in physics centripetal and centrifugal. Centrifugal with the F. Is it a PH? I think it's an F. Centrifugal with an F. That, I think that's like a, that's a false force, a pseudo force. Not, so, so in this class, no fake forces in this class. So, uh, if, unless you really, really want to go there and, and get things right, you might
OK, well, we know uh, the problem tells us how fast the car's going. And we need to know that to solve this. It isn't, this picture is not enough to solve this problem. We need to know how fast it's going. We know how fast it's going. We know the angle theta. Let's say that, uh, let's say, okay, it's just a busy drawing. Let's say that the angle here is theta, the angle between the vertical and the direction is, is of the ramp right there. OK? Just label that theta. Now, notice I did a different thing than I've done so far. Usually, I label theta the angle from the horizontal to the ramp. So don't be confused by that. It doesn't matter. Just, just, you know, just a different use of the symbol. But that also reminds me, I mentioned, a lot of students in this class will write down specific formulas they've seen in class for particular problems, but, they, but sometimes those formulas require a certain assumption about where you put your theta. So be careful you don't just use the same formulas. Think, oh, yeah, I always use the same convention because if you use a different convention somewhere, you might get burned. So uh, just be aware this is different than I did it last time. Okay, great. So I've got my angle theta from the vertical. I've got my, uh, uh, my velocity from my angle. All right, well, this is a pretty busy picture. Oh, yeah, now I'm going to list what I've given. What am I given theta. So I know where I am on the slope. I know velocity. I know, uh, what else? Is there anything else I need to know? I think that's all. Oh, I need to know r. I know how big the circle is. Okay, I'm given all those things. And I'm asked what the acceleration, right? Okay, great. Um, and I should make it clear this is not acceleration gravity. Given. Great. Okay, so let's make our free body diagram for this guy. He's experiencing what forces? Well, he's got a force due to gravity straight down. And uh, here, I'll stick to my usual convention, the dot for my free body diagram. So it's a free body diagram. And he needs a normal force. The normal force, is, as I've drawn it, is a little bit closer to horizontal. So it's kind of like this, right? And then this angle is theta. Does everyone see that? So that's my normal force. And I'll just label it S of anything. You can just end by itself if you want. I like using F to remind me of force. Okay, great. And now I can use Newton's second law. And we have, uh, oh, and what are our axes here? So what are the smart choices of axes? Well, there's a couple obvious choices. One's to go vertical and horizontal, which is fine. There's a lot of stuff going on, though, in the direction toward the center of the circle and along the direction of the ramp. You know, um, so we only have two forces in the problem. One of them is lined up with that, that second choice of axis I mentioned, one of them is the first choice. So either way, you're going to have to break this up into components, right? There's no way to get away. You can't get away without doing some trigonometry and breaking these up into components. But I'm going to solve it by breaking things up into uh, this direction and this direction, lined up toward the center and, uh, and along the direction of the ramp. And I've got some choices about signs and what I call x and y and everything else. Let's just, I'll just do this. I'll call this x and I'll call this y. Doesn't matter what you do, just make sure it's clear. I think this is a slightly easier choice for this problem of axes because I'm going to wind up using this formula over here for the, for the centripetal, for the, the center pointing component of the acceleration. And uh, if, I do, if, I, if I use these coordinates, it'll just turn out that I, just, I can just plug that in for the y component of the acceleration. I don't have to break that thing up into components. So I, just, I think it's a little bit easier to do it this way. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and plug it in and see what we get. So we got Newton's second law, we're in the x direction, we know what we mean by x now. I chose x to be downhill positive. So what do I get? I get, let's see, well, this, let's see. So let's, here's my free body diagram. On a separate diagram, I'm going to break this up into components. Mm -hmm. Right? Careful to put my right angle on the opposite side as the original vector. Components got to be smaller. Oh, yeah, I, I promised you not too much algebra. Sorry. Mostly trigonometry. We're going to do some crazy demos in a little bit, though. It'll, get, it'll, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be less dry. I mean, like, I might get wet. I might remind myself of demos we have today. So I hope it stays dry when we do the demos. So we got mg. Uh, what do I have? mg is just cosine or sine. So this is my angle theta, right? So that means it's going to be cosine. And this is going to be mg sine. Yeah, you're flabbergasted. All right, you plug it in. See the x component? Which is my x component? Oh, yeah, it's this part. So this is my x component, mg cos theta. It's positive, right? It's, it's positive because I defined it positive that way and gravity points down. Very good. I get what is the x component of the normal force? What's the x component of the normal force? Nobody's answering. Everyone, you guys are all, you uh, can't take it. It's zero. And it's awful watching something else So yeah, it's zero. You're absolutely right. There's no, the, the normal force is from negative. So that's zero. We said equals ma. Which a do I want? I want acceleration that is tangential. I can also call it sub x now. So, so in this case, a, when I say a sub t, now that I've defined these axes, all I mean is a sub x. When I see a sub uh, c, all I mean is a sub y. These are the same thing now, especially given that I chose positive directions to agree with the direction they're pointing, right? So my signs are OK. So I'll just put a sub x here. I know what I mean. Ah, but we know what. Well, do we know? Ah, we don't. This actually tells us. This actually solves for us what a sub x is, right? I think I know everything in this expression. First of all, as often happens, mass cancels out, right? We're left with g cos theta equals ax. So there we go. We've got the x component of the acceleration. All right. We're halfway there. Now for the y component. Well, we already talked through what we're going to do. It's the same as we did over here with the uniform circuit of motion. For the centripetal direct, for the center pointing component of the acceleration, right? We, need, we just need to write down the forces that are involved. So what are they? They are, uh, oh, but wait a second. If all I'm asked to find is the length of the acceleration vector, I actually don't need to do Newton's second law for y. That's all I'm being asked to do because that formula gives me the answer. a equals b squared over r. That is the component of the acceleration pointing toward the center of the circle. All right, so we can do this, and maybe we should, just so it's clear how to do this in case you were asked something else. But if I were to just answer that question, I'd say, oh, well, the length of the acceleration vector then is just going to be the square root of ax squared, just Pythagorean theorem, right, plus ay squared. What's that? Oh, it's just the square root of g cos, you know, g cos theta you know, squared squared, right, plus b squared, oh, it's b to the fourth over r to the squared, right? I think I got that right. So I think that's the answer. Does everyone agree with that? So in fact, the trick to solving this then was realizing, oh yeah, I don't need to do Newton's second law to figure out what, 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 the direction, what the acceleration of the center is, because I know that momentarily right here it's undergoing, it's undergoing circular motion, and I know what the radius of the circle is, and I know how fast it's moving. I was told in the problem description it's going velocity v. So yeah, I can just plug it right in for my y component, and I, and I just had to use this to get the x component. Now let's let's go through this though and just see what it looks like, just so you see what it looks like. So in the y component, there are two forces that are contributing, because gravity's got a component in the y direction, and so is the normal force, right? Now in those ramp problems we looked at before, right? Remember that? In those, in those problems where we have a, a, a flat but not horizontal, so a, a slope, we have a ramp, right? In that case, we put some object here, it slides down, we get this balance between the normal force and the components of gravity that points in the, in the normal direction, right? But then we set something equal to zero because there's no acceleration off the, the ramp. And then we just equate the two, and that tells us what the strength of the normal force must be. It's just the component of gravity that's normal, right? But that's not true here. It's not true because the acceleration is not zero in the normal direction. When this guy's going around a circle, he's speeding up, but he's also accelerating in that direction a little bit. It's not zero acceleration in the normal direction. Why? Because the ramp is curved, it's not a flat ramp. So when we solve for when we put in uh, out Newton's second uh, law in the y direction, we have a non-zero acceleration. In fact, that's it right there. That's a non-zero acceleration
because y is pointing that way, but this is pointing more in the opposite direction than in the same direction as y. So I get a minus mg, and now it's sine theta, right? It's this component over here. Right? Equals m a y. Ah, what's that equal to? That's m times v squared over r, right? Not zero. So this is how you'd solve for the normal component. Uh, excuse me, for the normal force, the force of the ramp, the normal force of the ramp acting on the car. This problem, of course, had no friction in it. We could have friction too. If we had friction too, it would enter in the x, but not in the y equation, right? Um, does this, so raise your hand. Who, who finds this completely befuddling and has no idea what I just did? Two hands from one person. And there's a few other people with hands up. Not too many, though. So who, who's comfortable they could reproduce this later on their own? Okay, so, so, most, so most of you are, sort of, the two hands are tentatively saying, yeah, give me a shot, you know? So, all right, yeah, yes? Here's the, I stuck in v squared over r right here for the acceleration because I know if the, if the object is undergoing circular motion, even if it's not uniform circular motion, if it's undergoing circular motion, there has to be, I, I know that the component of the acceleration that's pointing toward the center of the circle is going by that formula. So I'm just asserting that. Like the beginning of the lecture, I just tell you, that's just, just take my word for it. We did derive it, and I think the book probably goes through this a little bit. There's a little algebra involved. Aren't you bludgeoning you? Not too bad. This isn't bad as yesterday, or two days ago. Um, but, uh, but, so the answer is that you have to recognize in the problem, this ball is undergoing circular motion. That means it's accelerating toward the center of the circle. It may also be accelerating a little bit forward, right? Or backward, depending, well, depending on if it's going up or downhill. So that means the resulting acceleration vector can't just be in the direction of motion. I know its direction of motion is changing. So you could not plug in v squared over r for the x component of the acceleration. In fact, it's different, right? The x component of the acceleration is given right here. It's g times cosine theta. It doesn't depend on the velocity. It doesn't matter how fast the ball is moving. If I put the ball right here at a certain location and ask what's the x, and then release it, and I release it and I either push it or don't push it, either way, the acceleration in the direction of motion would be the same. It's just the component of gravity, well, it's the component of the force of gravity pointing in the direction of motion divided by mass to the acceleration. That's all it is. But this way, the acceleration toward the center, the component of acceleration toward the center of the circle, that depends on how fast it's moving. So think about that. If I start the ball off holding still on the ramp, and I let go, right after I let go, so immediately after I let go, its velocity is still zero. Right, still, it hasn't had a chance to start speeding up yet. In that case, there's no acceleration at all toward the center of the circle. All the acceleration is down the ramp. Why? Because v equals zero. If v equals zero, then the direction of the v is not changing. Dv dt is zero if velocity is zero. It's a little bit confusing to say, wait a minute, then why is the acceleration in the direction of motion not zero? So, so the, 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 it's sort of subtle to work out the math why that's true. But it turns out, and I think there's some simple intuition here, that the faster the ball is moving, the quicker the direction of its motion is changing. And that's what you're measuring by the component of acceleration that points to the center of the circle. It's how quickly the direction of the velocity is changing. So if the ball's not moving, there's no acceleration toward the center of the circle. If it's moving really fast, there's a big acceleration toward the center of the circle. So it's good to get facile with this kind of problem. These kind of things will show up. It's, it's, it, really, it really is a good way to demonstrate and understand how uh, Newton's laws work, what's, how to think about circular motion. Let me tell you some more things about it real quick. One of them is that if you had a ball undergoing some kind of crazy motion, suppose you have a ball in two dimensions undergoing some wild motion. Uh, it's got a little rock on the back and or something. So it's undergoing some crazy path. Well, at any point along the trajectory, if you wanted to, and this is more complicated, you probably have to solve a problem, but it's good to understand how this works. If you want to understand, if you want to calculate what the acceleration was of the ball, say right here. Uh, let me give you some better example here. Let's do it right here. Uh, right here. You say, well, I know what to do. All I have to do is fit a circle into this trajectory and then use that formula for my circle to figure out what the acceleration is. So I say, okay, here's a circle that sort of fits in. Oops, I sort of, it's misshapen on this side, so I get a circle. Ah, well, that's not very good. That's a little better. I think you get the idea. So I'm trying to just squeeze a circle in so that locally it's tangents right here and it's got the same local curvature. If I do that, then that tells me the effective radius of the circle that this ball, uh, well, it's, it's, it's momentarily undergoing circular motion. After all, if I, just, if I just take a little movie of its motion from here to here, I don't know just another movie whether it's going in a circle like this or whether it's following some crazy trajectory. The math is the same for the physics is the same for what's going on in this moment, this little brief moment in time. So all I have to do to figure out what the acceleration is for any given particle moving any kind of crazy path is to fit a circle into its trajectory and then say, okay, that gives me an effective radius. I'll use that with the v squared over r formula to get the component of acceleration that points that way. And then for the component that goes this way, I'll just ask how fast is it speeding up or slowing down. If it's going at a constant speed, then there's no acceleration in the direction of motion. And that's so like uniform circular motion, right? The ball's not speeding up, the ball's not slowing down. So the acceleration has no components along the direction of motion. That only happens if you speed up or slow down. But there is a component pointing to the center circle. Why? Because the direction of motion is changing. Velocity is changing. So that works for any crazy path. Anyway, just don't be scared by this. You're not going to get a problem test that's got some, you know, uh, you know, my name written in cursive and you've got to calculate the acceleration everywhere. Like that. But, but it's, you know, I wouldn't do that, right? Uh, these tests don't last that. There's not much time. Okay. So, uh, but, but that sort of thing can happen, right? It's good to understand how to think about roller coasters and Ferris wheels, you know? And, we'll, and all right, so, so we've done uniform circular motion. We've done this vertical circle with gravity where it's not uniform, but still circular motion. And we can still use this formula to compute just the component of acceleration that's pointing toward the center of the circle. What else do we, should we think about? Let me just, so let me bring out one thing that's kind of surprising. Uh, before we get on to that, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do some demos, too. I'm going to do a little bit more on the, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do the demos after I have more on yeah. So um, when we're thinking about friction, so I mentioned how, okay, there's no friction in this problem. There's, there are problems. Suppose you, have, suppose you have a car that's going around a circle or something like that. So, so there's problems in the book, I think, where you, you'll have, or in the homework sense. Maybe you have some cars. So here's some funky car coming around you, right, the headlights, and he's going in a circle, you know, and he's going around like that. Well, if a problem has, you know, coefficients of static friction and 